just as a, I'm sure you don't need to be reminded, but I'm just reiterating something, is that we're looking at Jesus, who's the exact imprint, um, exact image or imprint of the Heavenly Father, because in Hebrews chapter 1 it says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in his last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the, world, the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged us and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. We're looking, our overall theme is, is the fear of God, and the respect of God and the awe of God. And um, as, we, as we study him and look at him, uh, more, of, what, uh, more of, a, of a love, of a reverence and an awe goes towards him. And so we're looking at John, because in John, well, well, the Bible basically, someone said to him, the Bible is actually Jesus in print, because he's the word, okay? But John seems to highlight certain aspects of, of Jesus, so we're just looking at Jesus in that respect. I, I'm part of a, of a prayer thing, it's a worldwide thing. And it's, I just happen to have the app and I, I like to follow some of the things they do. And in, in today's little word here, yeah, not really a word, it's more of a, of a, of a theme. It, said, it says here, yeah, we want to become more like Jesus, seeing him more clearly, loving him more dearly, and following him more nearly, day by day. And um, I think it's basically our theme. We want, to, we want to know Jesus. And by knowing Jesus, and, um, we follow him, become more like him because he's our image. He's, he's becoming the imprint in us. Um, uh, I was going to read something else this morning by a guy called Bob Mumford, and he's talking about about this, uh, that we are born again not by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible. By the word of God who lives and abides there. But who's the word of God? It's Jesus. And he goes in there, it's, it's something you kind of know, probably know very well. But when we're born again, there's a seed planted inside of us. It's not, a, it's not any other kind of seed, but the seed that comes from God. Okay? So his, his DNA, if you like, is, is wrapped up in that seed. And it's probably when we're born again. And so the image of God and the DNA of God and the character of God is planted inside of us. Okay? And so as that gets nurtured and watered and whatever else, it grows. Do we become God? No, of course we don't become God. But but the Bible does say other things. It says that we are, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of God. Because it lives inside of us. Now how is this possible? I haven't got the foggiest. I just... I don't even try and work it out. It's beyond, beyond my ken. But there's that input. And as we, as we look at Him and gaze at Him, we become more like Him. That imprint is on us. Okay. Do we become perfect? No, but we're on the journey to perfection. Okay, just in case you thought I was perfect, I'm not. Just, <laughs> just correcting that quickly. <laughs> yeah, you had no doubt that I wasn't perfect. No. <laughs> you were pretty sure about that one. All right. We're looking at John 7, 8, and hopefully we'll get to 9. Looking at Jesus. Did I cover John chapter 7 last week? No. I started, okay. <laughs> because I, I looked at my notes and I thought, and, and I thought about the things I was going to say and I thought, now did I do it? I eventually had a phone call me and said, did I come? And she said, no, I didn't. So thank you for all of you. And, and if you're hearing something again the second time, 
then you need to ask the question, is the preacher lazy and is repeating something, or is there something God wants me to hear? Hopefully you're saying there's something that God wants me to hear and you don't accuse me of being lazy. <laughs> to hear and to hear and to hear. Oh, right. Thank you. Thank you for supporting me. <laughs> In my befuddledness. <laughs> John chapter 7, the, the theme of that. Um, you might come across other things as we read these various chapters. You think, well, I don't know if that really portrays Jesus in quite the way we've got on this, on this list here. And if you have another idea, that's fine. This is not a hard and fast list, but just a guidance and direction for that particular, that particular uh, chapter. Um, chapter 7, we've got. Jesus um, uh, as the water of life. Okay. Now, in chapter 6, <laughs> he goes through this, this thing where he talks about uh, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood and, uh, and consume me and have my flesh. And it says, and, it says, um, and many of his disciples decided I'm not walking with any, this anymore. Because what he, basically what it's saying is that you've got to be so committed to me that it's like you're eating me. You're partaking of me continually. And for some this was just mm, too heavy. And I think the words he used. And um, so he's, he, asked, he asked Simon Peter, he said, are you, going to, are you going to go too? Do you want to go away? And he says this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. Okay. And so, after that, quite a number of his disciples didn't follow him. Chapter 7. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. He did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. The only did, up to that stage, and soon after as well, he only did one miracle in Judea, in Jerusalem. Okay? And that's the, the healing of the, of the paralytic at the foot of Bethesda. Most of his ministry, 90%, I don't know, most of it was up in the Galilee area in the north, away from Judea. Because in Judea, they, the, all the heavies were down that way. Uh, Jerusalem and the, the high priest and, and the others, all the, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the whatever else. So, he avoided that, not because he was scared of them, but his time was not yet ready to be taken and crucified. And so most of the time he spent it up in Galilee. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he didn't want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. I, I just want to just, just explain the feast of... I think what I might do sometime, I might do the feast of Israel. They're actually very important. We don't keep those feasts as such, but each of those three feasts represents something in our, in our walk with God, our salvation, our baptism of the Holy Spirit, our sanctification, that type of thing. So, uh, I'll just see how how things go, and um, maybe we can cover those things. It, it just opens up the Bible a bit more. Anyhow, so the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles commemorated, that, that happened once a year, obviously, or each of those feasts happened once a year. It happened in the, in, in the about the seventh or eighth month of the year. Uh, Ninth, around about September, September, October, Feast of Tabernacles took place. In the original Feast of Tabernacles, when they were in the wilderness, on that particular day, the most important was their most holy day. It's called the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, um, uh, a bull and a goat were, were slaughtered. Okay? And the blood of that was taken and, um, and poured on the mercy seat. Okay, which is in the very innermost sanctum. On the mercy seat, 
to atone for, atone for the sins of Israel. Okay? They also took a, another goat, they laid hands on that goat and imparted to it all the sins of Israel for that whole year. And then by, said the Bible said, by the hand of a strong man, that goat was taken and led into the wilderness and released it. Whatever happened to it, don't know. Okay. Very important day. The whole feast was extremely important, especially the day of atonement. That's still the day of atonement. It's a, it's a, it's a Sabbath. Uh, even though Saturday might be the next day, this is still taken as the Sabbath, they'll still get the next day. And it's extremely important. That's their most holy day. Uh, incidentally, the, there's a, there was a, an invasion by, by the enemies of Israel on Yom Kippur, which is David Tonnant, their most holy day. So that takes the Israelis, uh, after it was about 1970, I think it was, takes the Israelis off guard. And of course, they paid the retribution of that. And therefore, these boots behind us, they ran across the desert away from the people of God. Mm. All right, I don't want to divert from that, but it's extremely important day. Part of that day, they also commemorated their, their, their uh, journey through the wilderness. And they did that by building little booths, which they stayed in for the next few days. They just actually kind of lived in there and operated in there. It was a commemoration of how God brought them through the wilderness, eventually into the Promised Land. All right, but that's just the gist of it. So, and so three times in the year, the men of Israel had to go to Jerusalem and worship. Uh, it was on Passover, the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost as we call it, and Feast of Tabernacles, those three occasions. So it says here, in verse two, now the feast the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. In other words, they say to him, Listen, all these oaks have left you. Maybe you should go hunt a few more and go down to Jerusalem during this whole feast here. Maybe you'll get some guys going after you. They didn't quite say it like, That's my, that's my language. That's what it boiled down to. Verse 5, it says, For even his brothers did not believe in him. <laughs> I don't understand how that worked, but anyhow, I suppose well, I've grown up with this guy. I know he's a little bit strange, but, um, you know, um, and he's a great carpenter, but uh, I don't know if he's quite the Messiah. Put all these stories about him or whatever else. Okay. <laughs> Verse 6, then Jesus said unto them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it, ha it hates me, but I testify of it, and its works are evil. You go to the feast, I'm not going yet. Uh, one of the transactions, I'm not going yet. When he said these things to them, he remained in Galilee, and they went off. Um, but after he'd gone, they'd gone down there, it says in verse 10, but when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to his feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. And then the Jews sought for him. Now this is in Jerusalem, this is in the main place. They're looking for him and wanting to kill him. Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Someone said, he's good. Others said, on the contrary, no. He deceives the people. So this is a whole wrangle. Mostly, of the people who were in Jerusalem. Okay, I know others have come down, but mostly in Jerusalem because they had not experienced the things that he was doing. The feeding of the 5,000, the taking of water into wine. They hadn't experienced those things, they weren't around, but the people there had experienced it. And so um, there's this contention about him. Uh, verse 14 is like Jesus couldn't resist it. What he heard from the Father. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters 
having never studied, I never really actually, the folk in Jerusalem, I've never really heard him teach. How's this man? He's, he hasn't, he was not part of any rabbinical school. He's just a carpenter. How does he know these things? Verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall now know concerning the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and known righteousness in him. And so on. And then he says to them, did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? And the people answered and said, You have a demon, man. Who's seeking to kill you? But, but further down from there, it tells us that the Jews were seeking to kill him. It's like, don't you know what's going on around you? You know? Verse 25, say, he speaks to them about one of those lines. Verse 25, now some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? They were seeking to kill him. But look, he speaks boldly, they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? Maybe they do. Maybe this is the Messiah. Christ being the, the Greek version of, of the Messiah. However, we know where this man is from, but when the Christ comes, no one will know where he's from. They, just, they didn't, they were befuddled actually, because the scriptures clearly teach where he's from. Then Jesus cried out saying, you both know me and know I am who I'm from. I've not come of myself, but he who sent me is true. For I know him, for I'm from him, and he sent me, speaking about God the Father. Verse 32, I'm just running through this just quickly, because I want to get to, the, the, to my main point in this particular chapter. And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these, which this man has done? And so the people, some of them started catching on. I'm talking about the people in Jerusalem. The people further up north were already catching on. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Let's stop this nonsense. Let's stop this talking. And um, let's go and arrest him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and I'll go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. And um, so they, they're still puzzled by his words. <laughs> I think most times people were puzzled by his words because they weren't thinking along those lines. They weren't, they, weren't, they weren't really looking at the word as it, had been, as it had been prophesied, as it had been written down. The law and the prophets. If they had really studied those things, they would have recognised it. Okay? Um, verse 36, it says, What is this thing he said? You will seek me and not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. Then it comes to what I really want to get to here, um, is verse 32. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spake concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. But the Spirit had not yet been given, because he had not yet been glorified. What they did during the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, as every day they would come with water from the pool of Siloam in a big golden so say jug, not a little, little jug, but a big golden jug. And they'd come with that water and they'd pour, they'd pour the water on the altar. And um, could one of you please just turn to um, Isaiah? Uh, 
So I wrote so small here. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 3. If you could please. What was happening here with this water and then if someone could just read out Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 3 in any translation, doesn't matter. And they would, they would come with that water or follow it where it was carried and they would sing the song and, and use that particular portion of scriptures. Rejoice and draw water out of the wealth of salvation. Okay? And so they pour it over, over the altar, all symbolic. It also pointed to the fact that in, um, um, there was a rock <laughs> um, that followed them in the wilderness. And that rock is where they got water from. And that rock represents Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4, let me just go to that quickly. Uh, if I had my plastic Bible, I'd get there a lot quicker. You laugh for me, man. I don't dare say the pages are sticking together. <laughs> First Corinthians 10. Um, and this is Paul writing, he says, well, let me read from verse 1 in chapter 10. I'll give, it'll make some sense. He writes to them and he says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. What he's saying here, what, what Paul is saying, the events that took place in the wilderness, coming out of Egypt. All of those actually happened, but they were also pointing to a future event. They were pointing to the coming of Christ, like Passover, and being rescued out of Egypt. Uh, took place, but it was also pointing to a future event. The event where Jesus would come, die on the cross, and bring us out of slavery and into the freedom of walking in the family of God. So it says, they were, and it says, going through the sea was representative of being baptized in water. All were, verse two, all were baptized into Moses, in the cloud, and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. Now watch this now. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So, what they were doing there with pouring the water onto the altar and coming out and talking about the wealth of salvation, using that scripture, it was all symbolic of pointing towards Christ. There were all aspects of that. And so, um, because in Leviticus 7, actually Leviticus 17, it talks about the rock that followed them. And they drank from that rock. Would, at one stage, when things had dried up, for whatever reason, and God said to Moses, speak to the rock, and he decided that there's no, I was after a of word out for, I found it completely, I've had enough of these oaks, and he takes, the, he takes his rod and he smacks the rock, and water came out. And um, because before that, God had said to him, hit the rock. This time he says to him, speak to the rock. And he hid it. And so it's, it's just symbolic of the fact that um, he was beating Christ. Although he didn't see it that way, obviously not. But points towards that. And so all these things that are happening there, uh, there's a... Uh, what happens in the Old Testament, there's pointing towards it. It's like, it's like, here's the main one. Here's Jesus, the actual Jesus. And these things here are a shadow. None of those things are... Are, they are real, but none of those things are Jesus, but they point to Jesus. Alright? It's like, to give you an example, let me uh, just do that. Um, Joseph. Joseph in the Bible. Joseph points to Jesus. Was Joseph perfect? No, of course not, he wasn't. Okay? But the fact that he went before his brothers and, and provided bread for them, he actually rescued the whole world, the whole known world at that stage, 
by the uh, fact that they prepared food and had stored up food for people. So there was a rescue taking place there. The fact that he was in prison, the fact that he was, in, he was betrayed by his brothers, all those, it points to Jesus. Um, often used the word, a typified Jesus, also used the word, it's a shadow. So the reality is Jesus, but Joseph here is not Jesus, but is a shadow. So that, it's, it's like that shadow comes this way, falls on, on him, and certain things take place. It points to Jesus. And so the Old Testament is full of it. But uh, I'm not going to change that right now. So what I'm trying to say is, this here symbolised the giving of water. A water that brought life to the people. And um, then he talks about the fact that this... Um, part of now. Right, yeah. Am I, sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. <laughs> My apologies. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He believes in me, as the scripture said out of his heart, will flow rivers of living water. But this he spake concerning the Spirit, when, whom those believing in him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So when the Spirit comes to speaking about it, He says, you see this water, it's water of life. That water of life will come and it come out of your very innermost being. Not little, little trickles of it, rivers of water flowing out. Why? Because of the fact that the Holy Spirit will bring that living water. Okay? And, it's, and in a sense, <coughs> The actual river of God flows out of heaven. There's no question about that. Okay? Brings life. But there's also an aspect of the fact that inside of us is a is the seat of God as well. Alright? And out of our innermost being, so when the Spirit comes upon out of our innermost being flows rivers of living waters. So as we walk along, okay? We, can, we, the Holy Spirit can actually affect people through us. There's these rivers of living water flowing out of us. There's the, there's the Word of God inside of us, radiating out of us. Are we perfect in doing that? No, God. Can we switch it off? Of course we can. We've been given free will. We can, we can choose. Uh, sometimes we don't, choose, it's not like a choice, well, I'm not going to turn on the water today, I'm going to make sure that um, <coughs> these uncle around me suffer. Well, it's not that kind of, of a thing that we can turn them on and off. But sometimes we just kind of lose sight of something like that. And, but out of our belly, the flood rivers of living water. That's why we talk about the fact that it lives inside of us. What do people see? Either they see vessel in, in the shirt and all the rest of it, but hopefully they also see something about me that's not of me, but it's part of me. You know what I'm trying to say? It's the Holy Spirit, the radiation of Jesus, the water of life. And, <clears throat> and that for me is, is the fact that we have, we have more than Adam ever had. Okay? The Bible talks about the Lord Jesus Christ being the second or the last Adam. <clears throat> what Adam had was wonderful. He betrayed it, gave it away uh, for seemingly this tree here, not of the evil. Well, I'm going to Go for that. It means I don't. Although I, I, I dare say the thinking was along those lines, but hey, I can do this without God. I can use worldly wisdom to conduct my life. <clears throat> the second Adam, or the last Adam, that Paul talks about him, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he re, not only restores what Adam had lost, but comes with more than what Adam had lost. Okay? 
And so we, uh, and there's not just one Adam around, I've got one person around full of the Spirit of God. There's hundreds and millions of us full of the Spirit of God. So in that respect, we have a lot more than Adam ever had. And so we're able to talk to God, walk with Him in the cool of the evening, in the heat of the day, um, in the bedroom, walking down the road, we can talk to God. Full of the Holy Spirit. I knew it. I know, I know. I'm just... I'm not going to get through everything I want to get through. Okay. <laughs> no, I wasn't trying to, to shock you. So, oh, did he die? No. One <laughs> He gives this word. Then in verse 40 it says this. Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, <coughs> Truly, this is the problem. There's something what he said there that kind of just clicked with him. <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's people all around reciting from Isaiah 12 verse 3 about drawing water and the of salvation. And, and these people knew some of this stuff. I mean, most Jewish boys, unfortunately not the girls, but certainly most Jewish boys grew up with quite a knowledge of the scriptures. Some of them went on to follow off after a rabbi and um, went on from there. But most of them had, had knowledge of the scriptures. They recognized this thing. Verse 41 said, um, <clears throat> so true, say, truly this is the prophet. Verse 41 says, others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will Christ come out of Galilee? And so there's this, mm, uh, mm, has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? Little do they know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He might come from Galilee, from the city born in Bethlehem. So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Now watch this. They sent out these the Pharisees sent out his officers to go and take hold of him, bring him in to deal with him. Verse 45, Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? And the officers said, No man ever spoke like this man. And the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd does not know the law, and they're accursed. So Nicodemus, you remember Nicodemus in John 3? Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our Lord judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? And he's coming with, with the sense, their sense of the law, their understanding. They didn't just condemn a man because they didn't like him or he... <coughs> He had a beard that was too long or whatever it might be. Whatever offended them about a person. They still didn't, you, you need to judge righteously and then judge by listening to what he has to say. So he says that to them. And they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. <laughs> I often think, you, you read that scripture, and these guys are steeped in the, in the law. They know, many of them could quote what we call the Old Testament for heart. That's how they've, they've grown up and they've learned, they've learned the Bible. They know the Bible. No question about it whatsoever. Jonah came out of that area, out of the Galilee area. He was there. No prophet comes out of there. Look. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and although it doesn't say this, but part of their tradition was that Elijah also came out of that northern territory in that area. And so it's interesting, and I think this happens to most of us. We have uh, got a particular track, and so we don't believe this particular person because. 
there's something wrong with it. Um, sure, it can't be right. And so I started accusing that person of being a philanderer, let's say, for instance. I'm not accusing Jesus of that, but of, of a philanderer. He makes a logical statement. The person makes a logical statement. And so what, we have, what, what happens is that instead of, instead of refuting the particular statement the person made or the logic of it, sort of attacking him as a person and his character. The logic is correct. His character doesn't make that thing incorrect, but to try and divert attention from it. Politicians often do that. They, there's a particular issue, and they'll attack somebody on the other. It comes out of that particular situation. These people, that party is not for us, and therefore this can't be true, and they divert their attention from there. So people start to do that rather than the logic, whatever it might be. I'm not trying to talk politics to you. I'm just talking about... And sometimes people argue just like that. You'll come up with something and, and speak about this or that. Say, yeah, but uh, who are you, though? What do you know about these things? Don't answer the argument, but attack my character or attack the person's character, which is what they, they're doing here with Nicodemus. Actually attacking his character and say, are you from Galilee as well? Look, it's not the point. He said this, do we judge someone without listening to them? Do we condemn them without listening to them? And never answer the question. All right, chapter eight. first portion of chapter 8 deals with, um, there's been a bit of contention about this. Um, some say it wasn't in some of the manuscripts, and others, and others it was in some of the manuscripts. But whichever the case, there's no question that this incident in chapter 8 actually took place. Okay? So the argument is not so much about about whether it appeared in some of the earlier manuscripts, did it actually take place? The contention, the general contention of the church, that thing did take place. And it's a story about um, uh, but Jesus, uh, verse 50, uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, now early in the morning, he came into the temple, and all the people came to him and sat down and taught him. And, and he taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought him a woman caught in adultery when they had set him in their midst. They were continually trying to catch him out. He can. I think you know the story of that. And for me, the, the heading in this particular, in, in chapter 8, is the defender of the weak. Other things take place in there. But for me, the main thing in this, besides the other things that take place, is the defender of the weak. Jesus could have said, hey, that's right, you know, could have said to the, I can't imagine him doing this, but he could have said, all right, okay, now let's answer, answer these questions. So you caught her, you actually know about it, and um, a lady, what do you think about it? He could have, could have asked all those things. But that doesn't, he completely ignores them. And then gets up and says, um, well, why don't the person who's has not sinned, let them cast the first stone. And goes back, ignores them completely, writes, they'd be contentious, but what did they actually write in the sand? Did they write the names of, of all the guys there and, and, and their, their acts of adultery? Or, there'd been all kinds of contentious about that. It's not the, not the point. He ignores them. So eventually they realize, oh, if I throw that first stone, it means that I haven't sinned. And the guys around you know what my situation is. And so they all just drift away. And I love the way that Jesus just deals with it, you know, in verse 10. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And Jesus says to her, oh, Jesus says to them again, I'm the light of the world. 
you who follows me shall not walk in darkness, have the light of life. That phrase is again repeated in chapter 9, and in chapter 9 we've read that up as the light of the world. But don't want to get technical about things, <clears throat> but he deals with her and speaks to her and brings light into her life. Where there's darkness, obviously the darkness of sin in her life, and says to her, go and sin no more. And, um, and you're free to go. I don't condemn you either. <clears throat> uh, I'm the light of the world. And so what he does, he brings light into the darkness, the darkness of this world. The other things that take place in this chapter, which um, I'm not, not going to deal with, again, he has arguments with the, with the various, with the, with the Pharisees and with the Jews. Um, in verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said to Jesus, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. Because if you're just bearing one witness of yourself, that's, that's not true. That's not acceptable. You would have two or three witnesses. And then Jesus goes on to say that my father's a witness. In another portion, he also said that John the Baptist was a witness to him. And, um, and later on, there's another witness that takes place. Uh, we haven't come across her yet in this section. And Martha's a witness. Martha, the one who worked in the kitchen, <laughs> and sort of Mary who, no, Mary who tells his feet, she says, you are, the, you, are, you, are the, you, are the, you are the God, you are the Son of the living God. She confesses. So he had, there were quite a few witnesses to that. But he, they want to argue that continually, the Jewish people are very much like even today, you know, and I'm, I'm not putting that down, you have down. But they'll, they'll contend with something, they'll debate a thing until it can't be debated anymore. It's part of a, of a tradition of questioning things. And that's right. Sometimes you need to question something, make sure it's true. They questioned him and they were befuddled by his answers, continually befuddled by his answers. And they still didn't back off. Because, as, well, as we have read later on, and we'll probably look at that later on as well. The main, their main contention was that the Romans would come and take away their place. They loved their position. And Jesus actually talks about it. They loved their position. They had front seats in the synagogue and revered by people, honored by people. Yes, Rabbi. No, Rabbi. Oh, yes. Whatever else. Okay? That was their main contention, their, their pride in what they were doing. Now we need to honor what if God's given us something to do, we need to do it well, there's nothing wrong with that. But for them it was a positional thing. And here is the Messiah staring them in the face. There's an honest one amongst them, there might have been a few others I don't know, but Nicodemus goes and searches the thing out speaks to Jesus, asks him questions, and comes away from there, well, probably 90% convinced, <laughs> if not more than that. And that's why he raises this point in here. Uh, we don't know what his answer was to that. It doesn't tell us yet. But he, he says, there was a, can we condemn a man without kind of just examining him a bit more? Does our Lord judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing, so they were actually judged him before anything else had taken place. Mm. And so that was their main contention. It wasn't that you see something stirred there. It's, they, they were faced with this, this man, and and later on, it hasn't happened here yet. Later on, he does something else. He raises Lazarus from the dead. And we'll get to that. I'm, I'm running ahead of myself. But he raised the Lazarus from the dead. And that, I don't want to use the word devil. I put the devil amongst the pigeons or whatever it was. That, 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 that upset them. Now that was the final straw. How do you argue that? And up to now, things have taken place. Man had been healed. And. Um, they still were, were not convinced about it. 
And I taught all of you from the scriptures. It was spirit beautiful. It was what? It was spirit beautiful. He raised him from the dead. Nothing. Oh, you cannot. You cannot. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> See that, that thing about the water is the one. Uh, there's a few other things before this time that could only be God, okay? But I think what they were saying, oh, this is just ruined. That's just, oh, no, 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 no. But it was irrefutable, and they still carried on with the thing. <laughs> All right. Uh, chapter 9. Um, I'm going to... Oh, let, me, let me just put... Let me quickly do it. Uh, in chapter 9, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned this man? Who sinned this man or his parents? And he was born blind. That was the contention. Um, when you read in the book of Job, those three, they call them comforters, those three guys that came to see him, friends, accused him, this has only happened to you because you've sinned somewhere, confess it. And went on and on and on and on about it. So the contention was, if there's someone sick like that, really a born blind, someone sins, maybe it's the sins of the, of the father or something, maybe there's some kind of a legacy of sin passed down, whatever, who sinned? And then Jesus says, and neither this man or his spirit sinned. But that the works of God should be revealed in him, I must work the works of him who sent me. What is this day? The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. He repeats that phrase. It's also in chapter 8. I am the light of the world. And as you look at this, this whole incident here, um, as you look at the whole incident, it's actually a picture of salvation. What takes place here with the blind man is actually a a picture of salvation. Um, and when he had said these things, he spat on the ground, made play with the saliva. <laughs> you might say, so that's disgusting. <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Just loving the thing, I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to do it here. <laughs> uh, take a bit of spit, not just a little speckle. <laughs> I mean graphic, I realise that. It takes a, quite a bit of spit to be able to spit on the, on the sand and make mud out of it. But what he does, although Jesus can spit on me any time. I, I mean that. <laughs> and, and he puts it onto, onto his eyes and the man does all the pool of Siloam. It's interesting, Siloam is also where they got the water from the pour onto the altar. There was something about the pool of Siloam, okay? Go there, uh, and he, verse 7, and he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sense. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbours and those who previously had seen this, he did, that he was blind. Is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I am me. It's me, it's me, it's me. They couldn't believe it. Can you imagine living during that time? We've known this guy for 30 years. He was always blind. What was the same guy as he had his hair done? What is it? Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes open? He answered and said, A man called Jesus. What was a man called Jesus? I just love that statement. A man called Jesus came. A man called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed. Receive my sight. Here I am. And they said to him, Where is he now? I don't know. They brought him, formerly he was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was the Sabbath. Jesus can't resist it. <laughs> I love it. I love you, Jesus. Wonderful. <laughs> of course, Jesus only did what his father said to do. Okay. And they said to him, where is he now? And uh, they brought him to the uh, form of the Pharisees. It was the Sabbath when he, Jesus made the clay to open his eyes. The Pharisees also asked him again, have you received his sight? He told them. 
Verse 16, therefore some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, talking about Jesus, because he does not keep the Sabbath. How dare he not keep the Sabbath? He can't be from God. Don't care what happened. How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? Others said, and there's a division. And they said to the blind man, what do you say about him because you opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. <laughs> But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called his parents of whom he had received his sight. Then they asked him, saying, Is this your son? They say he is. We know this is our son, and he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. His parents were, were just scared to really answer too much because they knew that if they they could be thrown out of the synagogue because the Jews hated this Jesus. Therefore his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Verse 24, can they call the man and he has the testament. Can give God the glory. We know this man is the sinner. Come on now, now. deny it. Come on, come on, come on. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. I don't know anything about this man. I don't know whether he's a sinner or not a sinner. I do know I was blind, and now I see. And that's, that's the, our story of salvation. When we come to know Jesus, we might not know much about him. Okay. Or maybe we've grown up in a church and we've heard about him and so on. When it comes to salvation, all I know is, and I was a sinner who came into my life. And now I'm no longer a sinner. I'm a person who walks by grace. And that's, there's the picture of salvation. <laughs> and they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Good grief. How often do you want to labor this thing? Then they reviled him. He said, well, <laughs> she says to them, why are you asking me this question? Do you want to be his disciples as well? <laughs> Wrong thing, boy. <laughs> you are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that, that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. The man answered and said, why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he opened my eyes. You're the leaders, guys. You are the guys we look up to. You know who this is, but you're the open minds. Since the world, he goes on to say, since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. This is the blind eye teaching them. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sin. Are you teaching us? And they cast him out. Can't, they don't want to argue the logic of it. And, and what he's saying is the truth, and they would have said the same sort of thing. So the solution is, call him out. Well, cast him out, and you don't. It's like it never happened. It's a picture of salvation. It's like I, I, I love Jesus. I'm highly amused at all the things that he does, and how and highly I've come all the things that he does and the answers he gives. We've got to go, Lord Jesus. We just thank you for the wonder of knowing you, the glory of knowing you, the glory of walking with you, the glory of having you inside of us, and talking to us. And we love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for what you've done. We go from you, we thank you that you never leave us, never forsake us, that you walk alongside of us. Amen.